Hey, biology students. This is our second lecture video on the history of life or biodiversity of life. And in this lecture video, we're going to discuss the origin of the eukaryotic cell by a process called endosymbiosis. So we left off in our notes from the first video that there are three domains of life so all life on the planet is categorized into these three uh, uh, categories that are very broad and they're called domains. And we talked about how these domains are um, organized primarily by genetic evidence, uh, specifically 16S ribosomal RNA analysis. And we talked about how the first cells on Earth were bacteria, they were anaerobic, and then later uh, mutation and natural selection um, developed, uh, we have aerobic bacteria, and then uh, our, the archaea, as well as eukaryotic cells. So in this video, we are going to focus on how the domain eukarya arose on Earth. So the timeline puts us at about one and a half billion years ago for the origin of the very first eukaryotic cells uh, by an event called endosymbiosis. So let's start by reviewing eukaryotic cell structure. At the beginning of the semester, we talk about cells and we talk about primarily eukaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells of two different categories, the animal cell and the plant cell. So here we're seeing sort of a cartoon-ish image of how animal cells and plant cells look and the complexity. When we did this lecture at the beginning of the semester, we took a detailed look organelle by organelle talking about its structure and its function within the cell, with the analogy that the cell is a lot like a tiny factory with all of these internal compartments uh, or structures that we call organelles with a, a unique function for the cell. This lecture, we're not gonna be reviewing all of the different organelles, however, Let's take an overview approach and notice, of course, the key features. So eukaryotic cells, remember the word eukarya, it actually means true nucleus. So these are cells with a very characteristic feature of having a true membrane enclosed nuclear compartment with a nuclear membrane that houses the chromosomal DNA of the cells. Recall the chromosomal DNA, the, the DNA, the form of DNA in the nucleus for eukaryotic cells would be described as linear, multiple linear. So the nucle nucleus houses the multiple linear chromosomes. Remember, that is different than prokaryotes that have no nucleus and a single circular loop of chromosomal DNA in a prokaryotic cell, like a bacteria or an archaea. So what we see in the eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell are all of these membrane bound or membrane enclosed organelles, things like the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum, the lysosome. We see a lot of these structures that we don't find in the prokaryotic cell. In addition, we find mitochondria. So the story here of the origin of the eukaryotic cell we really focus in our story about two important organelles that we find only in eukaryotes. The mitochondria, which in the animal cell diagram on the left, 
are shown in uh, colored blue. Notice that there are also mitochondria in plant cells. Okay. So in understanding the origin of the eukaryotic cell, we need to understand how the mitochondria um, came to be. Of course, the mitochondria, do you recall the function of the mitochondria? Well, we've talked about it a lot this semester. I hope you remember. So the mitochondria are referred to as the powerhouse of the cell or the organelle where the majority of the ATP that the cell needs um, is manufactured in cell respiration. So the other important organelle that I want to point out here is unique to plant cells, and it's called a chloroplast. Okay. So the theory of endosymbiosis, or sometimes referred to as endosymbiotic theory, is a theory that describes the evolution of the eukaryotic cell and specifically two organelles. And so specifically, we're looking at the mitochondria and the chloroplast. So in the diagram here, we're seeing an ancestral prokaryotic cell where many infoldings of the plasma membrane would have resulted in membrane um, structures forming inside of the cell, and then an event where bacteria, other bacterial cells, were essentially swallowed up by this primitive um, ancestral cell. And these would have been an aerobic bacterium and a cyanobacterium. In the diagram, we're seeing this process called endosymbiosis, which is literally an engulfment of another cell. So we see this large cell here in the diagram and we see a smaller cell in orange. This is an aerobic bacterium being swallowed by the cell. And we see the cyanobacterium in green being also swallowed by the cell. And the product of these, um, these events now gives us an ancestral eukaryotic cell with lots of folds inside of the cell. In addition, we see that those engulfed cells, those cells that got swallowed up, are now showing up as permanent parts of this cell. And these, in fact, would give rise to our two organelles. So there's a good YouTube video that shows this process in action, this sort of swallowing event. Let's take a look. The eukaryotic internal membrane system, called the endoplasmic reticulum, and the nuclear envelope may have evolved from infoldings of the plasma membrane in an ancestral prokaryotic cell. Such infoldings are common in modern prokaryotic cells. The theory of endosymbiosis proposes that a critical stage in the evolution of eukaryotic cells involved endosymbiotic relationships with prokaryotic organisms. Microorganisms that live within other cells and perform specific functions for their host cells are called endosymbionts. According to the theory, energy-producing bacteria may have been engulfed by a larger primitive cell and come to reside within it, eventually evolving into what we now know as mitochondria. Photosynthetic bacteria use photosynthetic pigments embedded in internal membranes to derive energy from sunlight. These bacteria may have come to live within early eukaryotic cells, leading to the evolution of chloroplasts. Several facts provide evidence for the endosymbiotic hypothesis. A few examples. Okay. So, Based on the video that you just watched, and in an attempt to make my lecture videos interactive, please pause the video and see how would you label the diagram 
that's shown on the screen. How we would label this diagram explaining the events of endosymbiosis. So we're seeing in this diagram, we're seeing a very large nucleated cell. In fact, the nucleus is labeled and it's shown in purple. So we know that this must be the ancestral eukaryote. Now that wasn't part of the blanks now, was it? But we'll write it in there anyways. So in the diagram, we see these little red, looks sort of like jelly beans, okay, um, cells that are being swallowed up or engulfed by this ancestral eukaryotic cell. So recall what the evidence suggests this, this cell was. So this cell was an aerobic an aerobic bacterium and allowing many generations to pass, we would say that the evolution process um, resulted in that aerobic bacterium becoming a permanent part of this ancestral eukaryotic cell and gave rise to the mitochondria. Now, singular, that's mitochondria, so we'll say that. So, in other words, the modern day mitochondrial organelle that is present in all of your cells and is so very important to the production of ATP for your cells has an evolutionary past as an aerobic bacterium. So, that is what primary and endosymbiotic theory is called. So this is called primary endosymbiosis. So again, our timeline is around one and a half billion years ago. What happened? Well, aerobic bacteria were engulfed by ancestral eukaryotic cells and evolved into mitochondria organelles. That is what we call primary endosymbiosis. That the mitochondria were once bacteria. Now this event is called primary endosymbiosis. The reason is that yeah, the evidence suggests that this event occurred first in the timeline of life on Earth because all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria both animal cells and plant cells. So a second endosymbiotic event occurred in the evolutionary history of life on Earth, and it's called secondary endosymbiosis. And that's shown by the bottom diagram. Let's change colors. Let's go green. <laughs> so here we see again this ancestral eukaryote, but now notice it already has mitochondria present in the cytoplasm. So that evolutionary event has already occurred. Primary endosymbiosis already occurred. So following primary endosymbiosis, in only some ancestral eukaryotes, not all, but in some, and the reason why I say some is look around, are you green? Is your skin green? No, it's not green because we evolved from a lineage of cells that did not undergo the secondary endosymbiotic event, okay? Because we are not photosynthetic, no chloroplasts, no green, right? But look around, who is green? Plants, algae, seaweed? Yeah, so they evolve from 
secondary endosymbiosis. Um, so not everybody does, but certain groups do. And so we have a second swallowing. So now this little green cell is swallowed up by this ancestral eukaryotic cell that already acquired a mitochondria and it said, why not? Let's acquire another organelle. Um, and this would be the swallowing of the cyanobacterium. And this would lead to the evolution of the chloroplast. So the chloroplast organelle has an evolutionary past as a cyanobacterium, a photosynthetic bacterium. And so this event is called secondary endosymbiosis. It's occurred after primary So this involves the cyanobacteria and they were engulfed and evolved into chloroplasts. Okay? So, biology and evolutionary theory um, are a science, aren't they? And as scientists, we love to see evidence to support a claim of this sort. And the claim is that the mitochondria that are in your cells right this minute producing ATP for you, if we look at their evolutionary past, their history, History tells us that they were once independent, free-living, aerobic bacteria. And if we look at the chloroplasts in plants and in algae and in seaweed, we are looking at the um, descendants of the cyanobacteria. The chloroplasts also have a history that their ancestors were bacteria. So how do we know this? How do we know that endosymbiosis happened? So we look at evidence in science, okay? So it's not just a guess. Um, it actually is supported by, by evidence and it's considered a, a component of theory of evolution that uh, has added to theory of evolution. So en endosymbiotic theory is sort of a, a branch of evolutionary theory that has been solidified by modern day biology and the tools we have to investigate the uh, mitochondria and the chloroplast organelles. So we say here that the evidence is really in the organelles themselves. If the mitochondria and if the chloroplasts were once free living bacteria, there should be evidence of that that supports that claim that they were once free living independent bacterial cells. So what scientists have done is look closely at these organelles and here what we, here's what we find. One, both mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own DNA. So it's separate from the nucleus, from the nuclear DNA in the eukaryotic cell. And get this, it's circular. Now, who do you remember has a circular loop of DNA? That's right, bacteria do. So evidence number one, that we have similarity with bacteria, circular DNA in the mitochondria. Number two, if we look at the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, they have their own set of ribosomes, separate from the cell's ribosomes. They have their own set, and it is the same size as the ribosomes found in bacterial cells. So they have their own unique, unique um, bacterial-sized ribosomes. So evidence number two 
that chloroplasts and, and mitochondria were once bacteria. Number three, the chloroplast and the mitochondria both have a double membrane. And this provides evidence of what we think happened, which was an engulfment of these bacterial cells by a larger primitive eukaryotic cell that it, they got swallowed up. And when they get swallowed up, they get swallowed up in like a little bubble. And so now they have an extra layer that they acquired from the cell membrane of the eukaryotic cell that engulfed them. Evidence number three. Evidence number four. The mitochondria and the chloroplast organelles replicate independent of how the cell replicates. The cell replicates by mitosis, but these organelles, they can divide by binary fission. And who else divides by binary fission? Bacteria. So bacteria do. So another check for they're looking a lot like bacteria. Evidence number five, genetic analysis. Remember 16S ribosomal RNA is a way that scientists can compare the, um, the sequences of DNA and RNA of cells to compare their similarities. And it shows when we look at that, we see a very close relationship between mitochondria and chloroplasts and bacterial groups. So lots of evidence suggesting that these organelles were once free living bacteria. The next question I'd like to address is why would this have happened? What, um, what, and how do we know, right? How, why would this have happened? So we think this was likely a result of a random event. However, the process of cell swallowing, which is what we're talking about here, okay? So we're talking about a large eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell swallowing tiny bacterial cells. Um, this process in biology is called endocytosis, and it's not unusual at all, actually. This happens all the time and can be observed easily under a microscope among single-celled organisms. For example, this is a very common way, it's actually the major way, that your white blood cells patrol your body and eliminate invading bacteria. And they do this by swallowing the invading bacteria and eating them and digesting them. Let's take a look. I found uh, under the microscope um, a little video. We can see that process. You're gonna see one of your white blood cells called a neutrophil chase down a little cocci shaped bacteria and eat it. Neutrophils are white blood cells that hunt and kill bacteria. In this spread, a neutrophil is seen in the midst of red blood cells. Staphylococcus aureus bacteria have been added. The small clump of bacteria release a chemoattractant that is sensed by the neutrophil. The neutrophil becomes polarized and starts chasing the bacteria. The bacteria, bounced around by thermal energy, move in a random path seeming to avoid their predator. Eventually, the neutrophil catches up with the bacteria and engulfs them by phagocytosis. They don't really burp, by the way, but they added that for cuteness, I guess. So they're showing you a process, they call it, uh, it's called phagocytosis which is a type of endocytosis. And it's a very common event to see among single-celled organisms. So we know that cell swallowing can occur. However, what must have occurred is that when that bacteria was swallowed up by the eukaryotic cell, it was not digested. And by not digesting its engulfed bacteria, the eukaryotic cell acquired something very important, acquired a new trait um, from this engulfed bacteria. And this provides now the eukaryotic cell a survival advantage. And so if you, if you recall the process of natural selection, natural selection is based off of if a new, if a new trait um, arises within an organism that provides 
that organism with a survival advantage that allows that organism to survive better than competing organisms, then that organism will survive and pass on that trait to descendant cells. So what is the advantage? There has to be some sort of advantage to swallowing up an aerobic bacterium and having mitochondria. Well, that should be a pretty easy answer for you to recall since hopefully you, you've got the point across from our metabolism unit that mitochondria are significantly important to you because this allows your cells to use oxygen and to make much more ATP per food molecule than anaerobic or fermentation pathways. So that's a huge advantage. And so by not swallowing up that aerobic bacteria, this gives the, the ancestral eukaryote the advantage to make ATP in an oxygen-rich environment. And remember, that was occurring in the atmosphere of early Earth. It, the atmosphere was shifting towards oxygen rich as a result of the evolution of photosynthesis. Second would be the chloroplast. What would be the advantage of having a chloroplast? Well, chloroplasts allow cells to perform photosynthesis, which for the cell is the ability to make food independently without having to go and swallow up or eat something Eat in, without having to eat another cell, rather you can make your own food from very simple starting materials, sunlight, water, and air. So another big advantage to become self-sufficient in producing your own food. So, now that you understand the origin of the eukaryotic cell, I want to put some events together with you here in a phylogenetic tree. So this would be a phylogenetic tree that describes the um, domain eukarya. So on this phylogenetic tree, let's place our first eukaryotes. So we'll call this an ancestral eukaryote. This ancestral eukaryote lived 1.5 billion years ago and branched into two major categories of life based on the events of endosymbiosis. So remember when we put in an, an event in a phylogenetic tree, now this tree, I, I made it going left to right. So as we're moving from left to right, we're increasing in time. Okay, so we're going towards present day as we move from left to right. You could easily shift this tree and make it go um, from top to bottom, but this works better for me and my screen. Okay, so we would put a notch here um, because there's a very important event here that occurs in the history of life and it's called primary endosymbiosis. And in a nutshell, primary endosymbiosis describes the origin of mitochondria, the organelle mitochondria. And now you should understand why the evidence suggests that the mitochondria in your cells were once free-living bacterial cells billions of years ago. 
So this event occurs here on the timeline because the way we read this phylogenetic tree, following this important event, everybody to the right of this important event would now have this trait. It has this new trait, okay? So the new trait would be the presence of mitochondria. So not all cells have chloroplasts. So when we write in the secondary endosymbiotic event, we're gonna put it here at this branch point. So we're gonna put secondary endosymbiosis up here. In a nutshell, you should understand that secondary endosymbiosis is the event that gives rise to the origin of modern chloroplasts. So like mitochondria, chloroplasts were also once free living bacteria called cyanobacteria that became permanent parts of certain eukaryotic cells. Okay, so what's remaining are some boxes here, and in the boxes, we're gonna write names of important organisms in this history of the domain eukarya. So the domain eukarya is based on um, four kingdoms. Most scientists agree on the four kingdoms, although it is an area of debate among a group of biologists that are called taxonomists. And the job of a taxonomist is to continuously reevaluate how life is categorized on Earth and looking at all of the evidence that supports how we group things in biology. How do we put things in the same category? Is it based on shared anatomical evidence or structures that are found in that cell? Is it based off of uh, fossil evidence? Is it based off of um, DNA evidence? It's a combination of all of those things, but just to be clear, not all scientists agree on this. Mostly, we have trouble with one of the four kingdoms, and more recently, most scientists don't even call this one group a kingdom because it's so diverse, um, and it's sort of a catch-all um, category for all biological misfits that don't uh, fit in any of the other kingdoms. Um, so... For the purpose of our class, I'm going to just simplify and say that there are four kingdoms, but um, that is under debate, okay? So we know that following endosymbiosis, the very first eukaryotic cells um, were also single-celled organisms, and they had characteristics that as evolution progressed would eventually give rise to plants, which we, we place in the kingdom, plantae, fungi, which we place in the kingdom fungi, and animals, which we place in the kingdom animalia. However, organisms in these three kingdoms did not just appear in the fossil record all at once or all of, um, of a sudden. Rather, they evolved from precursor cells, from precursor eukaryotic cells. And those precursor eukaryotic cells, most of which are still around today, um, fall into the fourth category of the domain eukarya. And this category is called the protista, okay? And we're gonna loosely call it the kingdom protista.
even though this is the kingdom that's most most under debate as far as how we should group these things. So because they are the precursors, and this would be following endosymbiotic events, we group these into, for the purpose of this class, we're gonna call them um, plant-like protists. In other words, they share characteristics with plants, but they're not true plants. We also have the fungi-like um, protists, very similar to the members of the kingdom fungi, but with some key differences. And then we have animal-like protists. The precursors of modern animals. So that's where it gets a little bit complicated because when we look at this category, okay, and actually let's do something. Let's take our highlighter and let's highlight these protist, these three protist categories. So this encompasses what we're going to call here. I can highlight this and we're going to call this. Oops. And we'll put this in quotes because it's not really agreed upon, but say the kingdom uh, protista. So the kingdom protista encompasses these three categories of protists, some that are plant-like, some that are fungal-like, and some that are animal-like. And in the next lecture video, I'm going to tell you more about the kingdom protista.